So today, you know, I, I knew I was going to be speaking and I was kind of wrestling with like, what am I going to be talking about? Um, you know, uh, like I'm an, I'm an introvert. Um, I really don't love the spotlight, actually. <laughs> um, and it's a really scary thing to stand on a stage and to say, this is what God's word says. <laughs> Uh, and I take this very seriously. And so I was, I was r kind of wrestling with what I was going to talk about. And I don't know if you guys, you know, you probably shouldn't, but you ever do like, God, give me a sign. <laughs> if you just give me a sign, it'd be so much easier, right? And you'd, you'd wrestle with, with it. And, um, and so I was like, God, I just, you know, just give me a sign, like what you want me to talk about. Uh, when I get up here and, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out. And so about a week and a half ago, I came to work and um, this photo um, so give me a sign. There's, there's your sign. <laughs> uh, if you're new to expectation, those that welcome home lettering is brand new to our building. It just got put up about a week and a half ago. Um, and so we've been kind of outfitting our space a little bit, adding some things here and there. And so I said, all right, all right, that's it. We're going to do some, we're going to talk on welcome home today. So uh, just like Pastor Christian said earlier, welcome home is one of our core values here at Expectation. And I don't know if I'm allowed to have favorites, like favorite core values. Like, <laughs> I think welcome home's probably my favorite. It's like every time I talk about one of the values, I'm like, it's my favorite value. <laughs> um, but welcome, welcome home really might be my favorite value. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit about this today. Have you guys ever seen um, those videos on social of like uh, of soldiers, um, servicemen and women typically returning home and like surprising their family members? Are you guys familiar with these things, right? They, they, they pop out from behind something or they run up behind them on the basketball court and they turn around. And it's this big, you know, occasion and all emotional. Those videos get me like every time. Every single time I watch one of those, like it just pulls on the strings and I find myself emotional. I was at the airport a few weeks ago and I saw these girls and they had this like homemade sign and it just said 235 days, yay, you're home. And I got so so excited. I got, I started to get emotional <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm looking around like waiting for the big homecoming. Right. And unfortunately I didn't get to stick around long enough to see it, but I was like, Oh my gosh, what, what a beautiful thing. These girls have this sign. I like started to take my phone out to like take a photo. And then I had to remind myself that I'm like a grown man and I can't take photos of young women in public. Like people frown on that. That's not cool. Um, and I'm like, what? Like, I, like, I had a moment where I was like, like, what? Like, why? Like, why did I get so emotional seeing that? Like, I don't, I don't know these people. Like, they're not welcoming me home. <laughs> like, it's not my family members. Like, what? What is it that that draws a, a response that that elicits this this emotional response? I think there's there's a reason for that. Um, see. You and I, we have been created in the very image of God. And when he created us, he didn't want like pre-programmed robots who had no choice but to obey him, who had no choice but to just simply do what we were programmed to do. No, he, he wanted sons and daughters who would choose to enter into a relationship with him. You see, in a healthy home, the father wants relationship. The father desires relationship. See, a lot of people see the gospel as this like behavior modification masterclass. Like if I could just do, do the right things, if I could just say the right words, if I just do the right moves, then maybe God would, would accept me. But this part's so important. Jesus didn't come to institute religion. He came to initiate relationship. He came to walk and to do life with people. And see, in order for him to do that, he had to give us something called free will, which simply means that like you get to choose, like you have the choice. It's not something forced upon you. You get to decide whether or not you want to enter into relationship with him. And since we get to choose, and since we get to decide, 
somewhere along the line, we have parted from home and we've all gotten lost. And so because we've gotten lost, there has been this separation from us and the Father. We are far from home. And that word lost, it's, it's so important because uh, Pastor Christian actually, we just wrapped up a series on evangelism called This Little Light. And if you missed it, I'd encourage you to go back and watch it. It's on our YouTube channel. But um, in one of the messages, he just he hit on this really, really quick. And, and I thought it was so interesting where we, we, we use that word lost. And we hear that a lot kind of in, in church. It's kind of like a Christianese word, but it's important that we recognize that the word lost, it does have this idea of being like directionless, but it goes so much deeper than that. When we say lost, I was like researching a little bit more on this. And when we say that lost, it really is antiquated to that of like being destroyed. Like, like when, when a ship is lost at sea, uh, it means hopeless. And I thought this, this definition kind of hit it on the head. It said, Perishing with death being certain. Man, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be lost. Uh, See, without Jesus, I think we all have to admit that we're all lost. (laughs) We're all clueless. The, The message of the gospel is that I was hurting I was broken, I was wounded, I could not do this thing on my own. And then I found a friend whose name is Jesus. Jesus is our home. And for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, John three seventeen. And so God's attitude towards you is not one of suspicion. It's not one of hatred. I mean, he's not looking for like an excuse to condemn you. He is on mission to save you. We, we get God's mission. Yep. <clears throat> we get God's mission statement in Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Simply just says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. If Jesus had a mission statement, (laughs) this would be it. And this is gonna lead us in to our text for today. If you have uh, a Bible with you, or if you have your phone, you can always download the YouVersion Bible app. uh, And we upload the the scriptures and the notes every single week to the YouVersion Bible app. You just go to the events portion and you can all see it there. Nicely laid out for you. Of course, we'll have it here on the screen as well. But Luke chapter 15, is really where we get our welcome home value from. And it's this this beautiful story. And it's important to note that the stories that we're gonna talk about today, like they can't be understood in a vacuum. Like cultural context is so vital and so important. In order for us to really understand what this means to us, we have to go back and we have to find out what this meant to them. And so we kind of need to reconstruct the cultural setting of the day and kind of set the scene. And so when we're coming into this text, what has been happening is that Jesus has been on tour and he's been doing some pretty radical things. Uh, And he's been hanging out with a few crowds of people that the religious elite of the day kind of frown upon and separated themselves from. And so... Jesus, by doing this, has begun to receive a lot of criticism. Isn't he a pastor? He shouldn't be hanging out with that that group of people. And so he's getting this pushback. He's getting criticism. And as Jesus begins to talk, it's important that we note that Jesus has two different crowds in front of him. On one side, he's got criminals and tax collectors and prostitutes. I mean, he's got the immoral group of people. And on the other side, he's got teachers of the law. He's got the religious elite. He's got the the Pharisees. And it's important because he's got both camps in front of him. And it's so important because we live in such a divisive time right now. And, and we live and we die by our labels and what groups we want to identify ourselves with. But, but Jesus never came to divide. He came to unify. He, he came to bring people together. 
And so Jesus has these two groups of people in front of him. And some theologians would say that what he's about to say is his response um, for his ministry. This is my defense for my ministry. You guys want to know like why I do what I do? Let me tell you a story. It's often how Jesus works. I love Jesus. And he goes on, he tells these parables and he tells this parable about this. He's like, all right, imagine there's a shepherd. He's got a hundred sheep and one of the sheep wanders off far away. He says, won't, won't the shepherd leave the 99, go find the one. And when he's found it, he'll hoist it on his shoulders and he will carry it home joyfully. And when he gets home, he's going to call all of his friends and his family, and he's going to throw the biggest and best sheep returning home party you have ever heard of. Man, it's like, who throws a party for a sheep? The price of the sheep isn't worth the party. Um, He says, man, just like this one sheep returning home, so... All of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents and turns home. And he says, all right, well, let me, let me continue the illustration further. And he says, imagine this woman has 10 coins and she loses one of the coins. Won't she turn her house upside down until she finds it? By the way, you would do the exact same thing. If like $1,000 goes missing from your bank account, you would be freaking out too. Um, where'd that go? Um, and says, won't she, won't she turn her house upside down until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call all of her neighbors. Hey, come celebrate with me because I found this lost coin. What is, what is Jesus doing with this? What, I think what he's doing, he's, he's kind of pulling his audience in, especially the religious elite. Because up until this point, like in terms of ethics, the Pharisees, they would have been on board. Like, like, like they would have agreed that the shepherd and the woman were both morally responsible for what they did under the circumstances that they, yes, they should go and they, he should search for the sheep until it's found. And yes, she should search for the coin uh, uh, until it's found. But where the Pharisees missed the mark and where they failed to carry the principle over, and this is where Jesus really presses in, is that they understood that the sheep had value, they understood that the coin had value, but they didn't quite understand that people have value. And Jesus does not place varying values on people. (laughs) No matter who you are, what you've done, where you've come from, and Jesus loves you just as much as everybody else. So then we get to our main text for today, and he says, all right, let me illustrate this point a little bit further. And we pick up our reading in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. It says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now. <gasps> this, this, this would have drawn a very large response from the crowd. This, this is outrageous. This, this is shameful. This is unacceptable. This is a flagrant violation of the fifth commandment. You see, in this day and age, um, typically what would happen is the patriarch of the family would have a state and they would have wealth or whatever. Whenever they passed away, that would be divided up amongst his heritage, right? Amongst their, their children, typically the firstborn receiving a double portion. And so for the son to go up to his father and say, dad, I want my share of the estate now was equivalent to him basically walking up to him and saying, I wish you were dead. Like, just give me what is rightfully due mine now. And so the crowd went, whoa. And honor being one of the most valued things in this culture to do an act of shame watch out. And so it would have been expected for the father to actually publicly shame his son for the request, for what he did, but he doesn't do that. The father actually grants his request. It says in verse 12, so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. 
Verse 13 goes on, says, A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings, and he moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. This son wanted to make sure that he was beyond the range of accountability. I'm going to a distant land. I don't want anybody telling me what to do, where I need to go, how I need to spend money, money, whatever. And what is sin? But I mean, honestly, simply, it's just a departure from the father. It is a desire to be independent of God. And the story continues. It's about this time, his money ran out. And sin is fun for a while, but it always runs out. <laughs> it says a great famine swept over the land. And there is always famine in the forgetfulness of God. And he began to starve. Sin tastes good for a little bit. It will always leave you lacking. It will always leave you thirsty. It will always leave you wanting more. And so it says that this son, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him to feed these pigs in the field. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. For a, a Jewish man, for this son to herd pigs in a Gentile country, this was one of the most degrading occupations imaginable. And this is like, this is not like a job contract. Like, all right, so what are my benefits? Like, what's my 401k? Like, that's not the situation here. It's most likely that the son became a beggar, probably found this farmer, latched onto him. And it was just like the only way to get rid of him. All right, go, like, just go feed the pigs. Like, just get off of me, whatever. Probably with no intent to even pay him. It says nobody gave him anything. But then we've got a turning point in the story. And in verse 17, it says, when he finally came to his senses. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, self, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and I will say, father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father. It took him a while, but he finally, <laughs> he finally came to his senses. And when he came to his senses, I love this. It says he returned home. He came to his senses. He returned home. He came to his senses. He returned home came to his senses, and he returned home. See, I think, <laughs> I think highly of you. I think a lot of us are very intelligent people. We live in a day and age where we have a pervasiveness of information available at our fingertips. What do you want to know? Just take out your phone, Google it. You'll know it instantly. I don't think it's so much that we don't know what to do. I think oftentimes we fail to turn insight into action. And so I want to challenge you today to close the knowing doing gap. <laughs> there is a gap between what you know you need to do <laughs> and actually doing it. <laughs> There's a gap. There's a space. And so I just want to challenge you today. What are the things that you know you need to do? What, do you, what are the things you know God's calling you to do and you have yet to act on them? So many of us, I think we, we procrastinate, we, we overthink, we make excuses. But you see, the enemy doesn't care how much Bible knowledge you know so much as you don't live it out. Truth in the head, man, is no good and will never get to the heart unless it is practiced by the will. And some of you have been sitting on a decision for years and wrestling with something that God has called you to. You know he's called you to it. You know he's been pulling you towards it. And yet you fight and you resist and you push. What, what is that thing? What is that thing? Could today be the day you come to your senses 
and you return home because this son, man, I like him. Like he might be a prodigal, but he doesn't procrastinate. <laughs> he is prone to action. I like that. And I love this part of the story. This might be my favorite part of the story. It says in verse 20 that while he's still a long ways off, so he makes the decision to go home. He's going home. It says while he's still a long ways off, his father sees him coming filled with love and compassion. He runs to his son embraces him and kisses him. So it's, let's break this down a little bit. It says that while he's still a long ways off, his father sees him. And so this isn't like accidental. It's not like the father just happens to come out the front door and just, could that be? I'm not so sure. No, no, no. The fact that he saw him from a long ways off and then he runs towards him, it indicates that the father has been waiting. He's been watching. He's been looking. And I believe that God is on the edge of his seat today watching you, waiting on you, waiting to see, is today the day that they're going to crest the hill? It says that while he's still a long ways off. And it says that the father makes a beeline for him. It says he starts to run towards him. So many of us, we overthink, man, well, what's going to happen? Like, what if I make this decision and I do this thing? Like, what, what if the, you know, like I'm going to get criticized. I'm going to get made fun of. Like there's so many excuses that we make, but here's the thing that I have found about God. Jesus won't often step in until you step out. Maybe Jesus is waiting on you, like, like take a step. So, so, and so often in our minds, man, we're so worried about like step 64 and step in mile 67. And God's like, would you just take a step? I like, no, just, just take a step, just one step. It says, like, like, just crest the hill while he crests the hill. And, and, and here's what I found, that when you take a step to close the gap, that knowing doing gap, when you take a step to close the gap, here's, here's what the father does. The father runs and he will fill the gap. You, you, got, you just got to take one step. I'm, I'm just taking a step today to close the gap. Jesus is going to fill the gap. Stop, stop worrying about what's going to happen when, well, all, the way, when, well, well, all the way down there. And when I get there, and I, oh, we start to just, our minds going a thousand miles per hour. And Jesus like, just take a step. We just, we, just, we just come home. And you know, that's all repentance is. It's just a step. It's just a turn. You know, uh, we have such a negative connotation with that word. But repentance is simply just, I was going the way that I wanted to go. <laughs> and I, just, I pivoted and now I'm going home. I'm coming back to God. That's, that's all that repentance is. See, it's important because in order to maintain his honor, the, the father, it would have been expected for him. And it actually would have been taught by the Pharisees, by like the, the, the teachers of the law in this day, that if, the, that if the son were to eventually return home, it would be expected for the father to not meet with him. Make the son sit in the outer gates. Let him sit in his shame and in his guilt and feel the full weight of it. This is what would have been taught and expected. And if the father was going to meet with him, it would have been on his terms. And oftentimes he would have had a list. Here are all the steps that you need to take in order for you to come back into the family. <laughs> but the Bible says filled with love, and filled with compassion, the father runs to his son. See, men didn't run. Men didn't run in this day and age. It was frowned upon. Not just that, it was like an act of shame because men would wear these really long robes. And so in order for them to run, they'd have to pull up their robes so they could run. And what that would do is it would expose their legs, which was an act of shame. But this 
father runs to his son. Why? Because he doesn't want his son to experience the shame from the community. <laughs> he, he needs to get there first. He needs to run to him. And, and, and by running to him, he becomes an object of shame. And this is what Jesus does for us on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Man, the father becomes the object of sin, draws attention away from the son so that the community doesn't get to him and beat him down for his acts and what he's done. No, the father runs to him and filled with love and compassion. His compassion spurred him to action. He gets there and he embraces him and he kisses him and he, he loves him. And, and let's not forget where this son just came from. He was working with the pigs and the pods. And so who knows what kind of film, filth, feces was caked onto this kid. And yet the father still embraces him and still kisses him and still loves him. Some of you think, well, I just, I just got to get clean. Like, I just got to get right. I got I to gotta make sure that like, I, I get my ducks in a row and then I can come into, and God's like, would you just come home? Forget about that. Just take the step. Man, the father embraces him and son gets to him. <clears throat> Dad, <clears throat> pulls out his speech. Verse 21, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But what does the father do? The father essentially just ignores him. It says that the father said to his servants, hey, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Let's kill the fattened calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. The robe, the ring, and the sandals, all representative of, of the sonship being reestablished into the family. See, the robe would only be worn by the patriarch at, of the family and only at the finest events. And here we see the father saying, hey, bring the robe, put it on my son. And the, the ring would have been the, the, would have had the family crest on it. And this is what they would have used to like sign wax documents. So the, the father's essentially handing him the family credit card. And then he tells him to put sandals on his feet it was, it was not common for servants to wear sandals in the house. And so all of these things are a reestablishment of his sonship in the house. See, the father embraces the son not based on performance, but based on position. And because, man, no matter, so no matter what you've done, where you've gone, what, what kind of things have happened in your life, man, you, you don't depreciate in value. Like you are still a son and a daughter. You are still a child of God and you are always welcomed back home. And we see this, this beautiful story where this son is embraced by his father and man, let's throw a party, he says. But meanwhile, there's always a meanwhile. Verse 25 says, the older son was in the field working and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he said. And your father was, has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. Notice that the older brother, he's in the front yard and notice how a critical heart will never go to the source. It doesn't go to the father, the one who can resolve the problem, but they will always find servants to talk about the problem. Rather going to the one who can give answers and address issues, critical heart will find people to join the pity party. <laughs> Can't believe my father would do such a thing. Oh, Awful, disrespectful. In verse 28, it continues, says that the father comes out and begs him to come out. So the father 
leaves the party, goes to the front yard, and has a conversation with the older brother. And the father runs to the prodigal and embraces him. We serve the God who loves and has grace for those who commit the crime and for those who judge the crime. <laughs> but either way, he's coming for you. He's coming towards you. And the son says, he replies, he says, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refer refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering you on your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Oh, the depths to which self-righteousness will dig. See, for years, this son had managed to conceal his true feelings of resentment towards his brother and his father. See, he didn't choose to express his prodigalism outwardly like his brother did, but he contained it inwardly and he buried it in pride and self-righteousness. But in this moment, his heart is exposed because that's what the father does. That's what God's word does. See, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so, man, heart check today. How's your heart? You could be doing all the right things. Saying, what, what's your heart? What's the status of your heart today? Because listen to this. The father's house can be close in proximity, but far in priority. So you might be in the home, but lack the heart. Did you know you can come to church? Man, you can even serve on an E-team. You could be in an E-group and still have a heart that is far from God. See, the truth is this brother, this older brother was profoundly more lost than his younger brother. Because this guy, he had spent years convincing himself and the, those around him that he was good. I'm good, I'm doing all the right things. And in doing so, it made it impossible for him to acknowledge that just like all of us, and he's a sinner in need of God's grace. And to this older brother, his many years of working under his father, man, they were nothing but slavery for years. I slaved for you. And in this very moment, it becomes clear that his brother's motives were actually identical to that of his young, younger brothers. Simply waiting on dad to die so that I can receive my share of the estate. He was just going about it a different way. And in a classic expression of narcissism and hypocrisy, he declares, I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> Man, the human capacity for self-deception is quite jarring. And we wrap up our story with verse 31 says, his father says to him, look son, you have always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. And just like in any good season finale, we are left with a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, uh, Jesus, uh, you forgot the ending. Um, what happens with the older brother? We'd like to know. <laughs> Everyone being left on the edge of their seat. But you see, Jesus didn't do anything by accident or unintentionally. This story was left open-ended on purpose because it turns out that this is a write your own ending story because it's your story <laughs> and it's my story. And just like we talked about that free will at the beginning, man, you get to choose how you respond to Jesus's invitation. What is that invitation? Man, just come home. So stressed, so worried, thinking about something like just come home. Jesus wants you in the house. 
He is a good father. So let me just ask you the question today, where are you at? Where do you need to start closing the gap? And maybe where do you need a healthy heart check? Where, where are you at today? Just like those girls who made that sign, 235 days, yay, you're home. Man, could today be the day for your homecoming, for you to return home? Man, we're gonna be having baptisms tonight and I'm so excited. It's gonna be such a celebration. And just like the robe and the ring and the sandals, they're all symbols. That's all that baptism is. Pastor Christian talked on that before. Baptism is simply just an outward expression of an inward transformation. It's you showing the world, hey, I have decided. <laughs> I choose to follow Jesus. And so maybe that's you. Maybe that needs to be you today. Man, we're gonna have pastors and our team at the red tent after the service today, man, if, you, if you're feeling that pull, close the gap, come talk to us, come pray with us, close the gap, don't wait. And expectation, let me wrap up with this, man, let us never become a church that judges and criticizes lost children of God returning home a church that doesn't assume the worst about people, but we truly believe that the best is yet to come and that we readily celebrate when they return home. We are a place for the broken to come home, for people to find relationship with Jesus. So no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've come from, man, that can be you. That can be you today. Man, and just like Jesus' mission statement, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's our mission statement. <laughs> Jesus is obsessed with lost things. And so, is, so are we. We exist so that people far from God will experience faith in Christ. So what's your move? How's the story end? <laughs> 